Hi, my name is Dr. Ross Hauser. Welcome to the Hauser Neck Center here in Fort Myers, Florida. We're going to talk about an interesting disease, achalasia, which is a condition whereby the lower esophagus motility is lost. Most of us are familiar with gastroparesis. Gastroparesis is a condition where the motility of the stomach is lost, but esophageal dysmotility, gastrointestinal dysmotility, these conditions where the contraction of the digestive tract is abnormal, usually it's that the digestive tract isn't contracting, is getting more and more and more common. It is just getting more and more common. Why you haven't heard the term achalasia is because many times people actually have achalasia, but it's diagnosed as gastroesophageal reflux. Like we've, we're all kind of familiar with that. Like it used to be on TV, you'd see all these advertisements for Tums, right? Tums and different things, because you know somebody would eat something, then the stomach acid would go into the esophagus, right? So gastroesophageal reflux. But you're gonna see by the end of this that a lot of these conditions are caused by the same thing, which is vagus nerve degeneration. So achalasia, this article is achalasia vagal disease. So I would recommend that people look at that article because you'll see that there's so much data that achalasia or a loss of contractility of the lower esophagus is because there's vagal nerve cells dying and basically those nerve cells dying then cause the various nerve plexuses in the esophagus, parts of the enteric nervous system, then those cells die that you can actually see on histiologic specimens when they take the cells in the area that they're like, geez, there's a loss of nerve cells. So you could say then that achalasia is from damage or death of vagal neuron cells. So it's a type of neuropathy, vagal neuropathy. And you know, Dr. Hauser believes that vagal neuropathy, the most common cause of that is actually cervical destructure or a breakdown of the cervical curve causing stretch compression of the vagus nerve which runs in the front of the neck. There's lots of different clues that a person would have their achalasia from a vagus nerve injury. So I just wanna go through some of them. Now you know on other videos that I've done, when you say ah, and your uvula deviates to one side, that's a sign of vagus nerve degeneration. So that would be one clue. Another clue is if somebody had anxiety for no reason, like they just feel this anxiety because the vagus nerve is what gives peacefulness, calmness to the body. Another clue that a person who has achalasia or has been diagnosed with achalasia, that there's a vagus nerve problem is that they're getting bouts of tachycardia. So the patient that I'm gonna present, and I'll show, her, show you her barium swallow, she definitely is getting bouts of tachycardia, and then she had seen cardiologists and all kinds of people, and they couldn't tell her why that was. Well, it's because you'll see that she has left vagus nerve degeneration. I'll show her test results. So anybody who has tachycardia or arrhythmia with no apparent cause, it could be, a, it could be from a vagus nerve problem. This particular person, the case is she was getting, uh, the reason why we did the barium swallow was she felt like around right here the food was getting stuck. So that would be a reason to do a barium swallow and see if there is something getting stuck. But another uh, sign that achalasia is from a vagus nerve problem is that if somebody has gastroparesis, in other words, when they do eat, it just seems like the food sits there and it's as if they're gonna regurgitate it, they get nauseated, or it sits in there 
and then they actually do get reflux because the stomach is just not working. Like it's not contracting, it's not churning up the food, it's not making chyme because that's what happens in the digestive tract. You eat food, mixes it with stomach acid, that forms a substance called chyme. Then at some point when it's broken down enough, your pyloric valve is supposed to open up and then it goes into the duodenum. When you have vagus nerve degeneration, well, the pyloric valve doesn't work good, doesn't work so good, it doesn't open up. So even pyloric stenosis can be from vagus nerve degeneration. So those are just some little clues that the person has a vagus nerve problem. So these are the actual readings of my patient and you'll see that their cross-sectional area is very little. The cross-sectional area of a healthy vagus nerve is around three millimeters squared. The diameter on the right one is just below normal. 1.5 is the cutoff that we use as far as diameter, but see the left one of 0.8. So that's also why the left vagus nerve innervates the heart. So that's why she was getting tachycardia. The main symptom she had is like she'll swallow and she just felt like everything just sticks there, like every all the food just sticks there. And they had done endoscopy and different things and they could never find anything. This was her actual ultrasound, one of the ultrasound scans, and you could see that's the vagus nerve and just the cross-sectional area, that's how we do the cross-sectional area. In the office, when we do a video fluoroscopic exam with the person swallowing barium, so barium, you'll see that it shows up on the video, and we use this for people who have swallowing difficulties or they feel like something's getting stuck. And it helps us just uh, figure out if there is something wrong. Like in this person, you'll see that they, <laughs> yeah, they, it definitely showed what was wrong and how the food was sticking. But you can see that this person prior to seeing me already had a cervical fusion. So that's kind of like the first step of what's wrong. And then interestingly, even though she has this uh, fusion here, you're gonna see that when she swallows, the pharyngeal phrase of the swallowing is actually fine. And then as the barium goes down, you're gonna see that it kind of, it goes pretty quickly like normally. And then somehow like around here, it just seems to slow down. And then you'll see that it stops and it just sits there and clearly the esophagus is small here, like it's small here, small here, small here, and then right around here you'll see it dilates. So these are all classic signs of achalasia. So here we go, let's watch the video together. So, okay, so see that went down really good. It didn't get caught where the fusion is. Now let's watch it. I guess now she's swallowing, it's coming down, it's coming down. See, it's coming down, see it's very thin, very thin, very thin, then look at that, it just sits there. Look at how dilated it is, it's trying, it just sits there, it's sitting there, it's sitting there, it can't get through, it can't get into the stomach, can't get in the stomach, it just sits there, it sits there, it sits there, it's all dilated. The esophagus is trying to do something, it just sits there and there it finally goes, then it finally goes, so. You know, you could see like it definitely showed the problem that the gastroesophageal junction, the lower sphincter there, it wasn't opening and you know, this just isn't working right. So we saw in that barium swallow like right here, it's very, very dilated and it just sits there. Most of us know you swallow something, you know, it just gets into your stomach, no, no big deal. So in this particular patient, this thing is an opening and then this is getting more and more dilated. So the, so the vagus nerve innervates the sphincter plus it innervates the lower esophageal mucosa and it causes contractility. My enteric or Auerbach's plexus of the digestive tract, the vagus nerve innervates the enteric nervous system causing contractility. Specifically, esophageal motor innervation occurs by vagus nerve stimulation of the Auerbach and Meisner's plexus. There's a reference here. Electrical stimulation of the vagus nerve restores motility in an animal model of achalasia. So that would be one of the uh, clues that it's actually vagus nerve degeneration that causes achalasia. 
then evidence that achalasia is from vagus nerve disease. And again, another great article, achalasia, vagal disease, um, impaired function of the stomach, gallbladder, and sphincter of OD are common with achalasia. And these are all structures that are innervated by the uh, vagus nerve. So the sphincter of OD is basically the sphincter that lets stuff out of the gallbladder and pancreas into the digestive tract to absorb food. So even some gallbladder disease, pancreas disease, I think has its origin in a dysmotility, if you will, of the sphincter of OD. So then if the gallbladder can't normally release the uh, bile, for instance, well, what's gonna happen if bile's just sitting in there? You're gonna get a gallstones. And even if you research pancreatitis, like why does the pancreas all of a sudden it starts eating itself and people have bouts again of pancreatitis, pancreatitis. And if you research pancreatitis, there's not a known cause for most cases of pancreatitis. And in the VA, I saw a lot of when I was in training from 1988 to 1992 at Heinz VA Hospital in Chicagoland, I saw lots of cases of pancreatitis, lots of cases of pancreatitis. So in hindsight, I think some of these cases are because the sphincter is an opening. So somebody eats and the pancreas is to release enzymes into the small intestine. Well, imagine if the sphincter didn't open. Well, what's gonna to happen to all those enzymes? It's gonna eat up the pancreas, and then all of a sudden the pancreas is like all inflamed, and it's perhaps the most painful condition a human being can have. So that's just other things that could become coming from the vagus nerve. About 50% of patients with achalasia demonstrate denervation of the ganglion cells of the stomach. So again, the vagus nerve innervates the, uh, and the, all the, basically the nerves that go to the digestive tract that give the digestive tract motility, open up the sphincters. The vagus nerve also innervates the sensors that like if somebody has heartburn because the stomach has too much stomach acid, that uh, sensation would occur through the vagus nerve. Autonomic dysfunction in the vagus nerve outside the esophagus is noted when patients with achalasia. So that's like what I talked about, the tachycardia, right? Tachycardia, or the person might have other symptoms of dysautonomia. For instance, they might have blood pressure problems uh, and other autonomic nervous system problems. In animal models, vagus nerve stimulation restores esophagus function with achalasia. So this is another great article called The Pathophysiology of Achalasia and Diffuse Esophageal Spasm. Esophageal motility disorder characterized by a peristalsis and impaired relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter. So that's how they're uh, characterizing achalasia where the lower esophageal sphincter doesn't open and then a peristalsis mean there's no peristalsis in the lower esophagus. On that barium swallow, you just saw the stuff sitting there. There's a little bit of peristalsis, but really not much. And then the sphincter is all closed, so the food, the barium liquid just sat there. So imagine if that person ate a chicken sandwich, right? And the chicken stuff's just sitting there. So again, people who vomit a lot, who are nauseated a lot. And so anyone who has, where it just seems like food sits there, you gotta think of, you might have a vagus nerve issue and you might have achalasia. Barium swallow study, of course, shows esophageal dilatation with constriction of the gastroesophageal junction. We saw that pathology involves marked decrease of neurons in the nerve plexus in the esophagus. And again, the people have regurgitation of food, they have heartburn, they have food sticking in the chest, and of course they have difficulty swallowing, like it can even be painful. Vagal function in achalasia of the cardia, so this is again another article, it just shows that basically the stomach, the lower esophagus, the lower esophagus, then the lower esophageal sphincter all have 
vagal nerve degeneration, so neuropathy, vagal neuropathy, if it will. So, the, so basically, <laughs> the triad, the esophagus, the sphincter, the stomach, they're just not working normally. And you can imagine, man, that's a terrible thing to have. So imagine if every time you ate, you actually dreaded it. You know how most of us eat, like that's like a happy time. So imagine if every time you ate, you were nervous about it. And I've definitely seen people where they've lost just unbelievable amounts of weight because they're so afraid of eating. And I've even seen problems like this in young people, even in teenagers. Like one of the patients that we're currently treating, she's a really cool like 75 year old. She normally weighs like 110. And my staff, before we accepted her as a patient, they said she weighs 78 pounds. You know what I mean? So this stuff can be like really, really serious. Phrenic and vagus nerve innervation of the diaphragm and esophagus. So basically a broken neck structure, cervical destruction, reversal of the curve can significantly affect breathing through the vagus nerve, which innervates the diaphragm. In addition, swallowing can be negatively impacted because of the vagus nerve stretch and compression. Uh, as it innervates the esophagus and lower esophageal sphincter. So I just kind of have this in here just to note that, you know, when you have a neck problem, often nerves aren't isolated. So on the internet, when people email us and my staff is saying, well, is this something we can help or not help? It's always like, are there associated symptoms? So in other words, like right here is the diaphragm. So right here is the diaphragm. Then when the phrenic nerve, which is C3, C4, C5, when that has issues, people can have issues with their diaphragm. So if the diaphragm, like I'll give you an example. So if the diaphragm is contracting too much, that's where you get chronic hiccups. Like you get chronic hiccups. And then right recently, this was last week, I saw a patient who they're like 90% better with their chronic hiccups just by us helping the neck structure. They had severe instability at C3, C4, C5, irritating the C3, C4 nerves, which form the phrenic nerve, and that's what led to the diaphragm problem. If the diaphragm doesn't work right, then of course you get breathing problems. Because I'm just saying, it's very common with people with digestive problems to have breathing problems. And nobody can, the doctors don't know what to do, like, they do, you know, they do a chest x-ray, they do an endoscopy, they do, but structurally you may not see anything. So even if the esophagus is dilated, you may not see like damage of the esophagus. So the person gets an endoscopy and they say, no, your esophagus is good. And then because they're under anesthesia, the lower esophageal sphincter opens and they get the tube in there and they're like, you know, we don't see anything because it's a motor problem, like the things aren't opening or closing normally. So it's a motor problem, which we found when we did the barium swallow. And then just to go over again, the vagus nerve only has 100,000 neurons where the enteric nervous system has 500 million. So that means that if you have a vagus nerve injury of one cell, nerve cell, that might innervate 5,000 nerve cells in the esophagus or the stomach. So any sort of loss of vagal neurons is very, very significant. The ganglion or the cell body of the vagus nerve lies in the jugular ganglion or the no-dose ganglion. Both of them are around C1. So that's why atlas instability or a cervical destructure where the atlas is way forward, it can compress and stretch the jugular and no-dose ganglion, which are also called the inferior and superior vagus ganglion. And so it's knocking out the DNA or the brains of the vagus nerve. That's why it's so horrible. And then cervical vertebrae basically are the protector and damager of the vagus nerves. That's basically the point of this. So if you've been diagnosed with gastroesophageal reflux, gastroparesis, achalasia, 
even Barrett's esophagus, where there's, you know, and that's a precancerous lesion of the lower esophagus, I'd really encourage you to look at maybe you have a broken neck structure and you might have injury to the ligaments of the neck causing cervical instability, especially upper cervical instability. And that could actually be the cause of the vagus nerve neuropathy or vagus nerve damage. And that's what's actually leading to all this, these syndromes, including esophageal dysmotility, lower esophageal sphincter constriction and achalasia. The treatment, of course, is to restore the cervical curve, which can be as simple as, you know, keeping your computer screen up, not looking down at your cell phone, and various methods of curve correction, which we do one of them where we put weights and then we use x-ray with different weight system, chest weight, head weight, to get your cervical curve good. And vertebrae, which are misaligned, we uh, realign them. And then if instability is found by digital motion x-ray, we do a treatment called prolotherapy that stimulates the ligaments to tighten and thicken. And then over time, we see that the vagus uh, nerve diameter increases, the vagus nerve starts functioning more normally, and that's the point where people start to get symptom relief, where the patient that we talked about then Gradually, her swallowing is improving, and the prognosis, of course, is very good because we're addressing the cause of her condition.